Whoa. So something you may not know about me, which is weird. Well, there's a lot of weird things you probably already know about me, but I love end-of-the-world movies. Like, the world is going to end. I'm like, that's the best movie ever. Everything blew up? Oh, that's awesome. And uh, I'm just weird that way. I don't know what it is. So, I mean, even like I Am Legend, which is totally like weird and but everybody's like a zombie or something, I don't remember. And then, you know, all these movies. So that one's from some movie where uh, the world was going to end 10 years ago. What year, what was it? No, no, that one's from, Geostorm was a different one, that's a good one. Uh, this is from 20, 2012, when the world was going to end the first time. It's tried to end a few times, apparently, according to the Mayans. So, anyway, let me say hi to a few people real quick, because I didn't get to do that earlier. DJ, we're glad to see you. Mary Ann Pettit. Even though you work at the DMV, we love you and appreciate you. You know, in the Bible, God, uh, uh, tax collectors were separated from sinners. Did you know that? They say tax collectors and sinners. You ever notice that? So, like, sinners are like, you know, robbers, prostitutes, murderers, and tax collectors, which they considered worse. Marianne, we don't consider that for you. Uh, Kim, Josh, you're here and said hi. Don Ritter, Lisa Cuppet, and a few others. And we're glad you guys are watching live online. So here's the series verse. Then the Lord said to him, talking about Moses, what is in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a snake, and he ran from it. God could have given him warning, hey, guess what? <laughs> this, you, get ready, but he didn't. And in life so often, that's how life goes. We don't really have warning about what's next. You don't know from last week to this week. And for some of you, things have radically changed from last week to this week and next week. But we know in eternity God's warnings for us. And, you know, when I watch these movies and I see like this little clip, I see the guy with the briefcase. And if you're like me, you try to help those people. So you think... Guy, hold on to your briefcase. Put it over your head. What are you doing running out there? And I'll never forget. I don't really like scary movies, but I went to a scary movie one time because a friend talked me into it. And we sat behind these people, this whole group of people who talked to the people on the screen. Don't go in there. No, no. Don't go. No. Don't go in there. Don't go. And it was funny, but I did not laugh out loud until... So it was the typical scary movie where somebody would say, let's separate and, and search for that. And you're like, no. And of course, all the people in front of us, no. And this lady walks, or a guy walks into the room where all of a sudden the bad guy pops up. And the lady in front of us said these two words that I will let you know my ADD has clung to these two words. They still come up in my mind in certain situations. And she just said this. He did. And when she said, he did, I could not help but laugh out loud, which was an awful response in the theater. I had to actually go out for a minute and compose myself and come back. But here's what you don't understand that happens to me now. When I see a man say something rude to her husband or to his, to his wife, in my mind, I think, he did. When I see something, somebody do something dumb on the road, I think, he did. That's what comes to my mind over and over. Why? Because I'm trying to warn, oh, no, don't do that. And you should hear me in the car. I, I, I honestly am not yelling at people, but I am trying to encourage them to improve their driving. I am the encourager of people, whether it's here or in my car, and so I do that. So I want you to know something today that's really important, and I hope this message gives you maybe a view of God you've never had, maybe an understanding of the Lord's Supper you've never had, and maybe for you, if you're not a believer, it will stress to you the importance of God's grace to take care of the problem of God's wrath. Because the truth is, God has not changed, and we do not deserve grace. And all of us know that. Listen, if you want to find out if you need God's grace, try to go on any kind of diet today. I don't care if it's a food diet, and some of you are like, well, I can do food, I can do whatever I want. Some of you don't have a sense of taste anymore because of COVID, so you're not even hungry, right? That's, uh, that was specific for a person in here in the back of the room that's running the video right now. But anyway, so, so some of you don't have a sense of taste, and, and we don't like you right now for that reason. But, but others of you, you know, maybe it's the internet. 
Maybe for you, it's your phone. Like you go on a diet, you say, I'm not going to look at my phone today. And what happens? Inside of you, this monster rises up that says, got to have it. If you thought to yourself, I will not eat Girl Scout cookies this year. You will see more Girl Scout cookies than you've ever seen it. And you'll want Girl Scout cookies. Right? Because in us, that sin nature. So we understand, I can't make it on my own. I need grace. Only one time in my life I've had a hard time with somebody when I said, are you a sinner? They said, no. I I didn't even know what to say to them. I was like, what does that mean? And I'm thinking, well, you're prideful, but I didn't say that. Right? We all know that struggle, and we can't approach God, and that's our biggest problem because he's perfect. But he gives us grace to avoid his wrath. He provides for us through his blood, which we're going to talk about today, and he still takes care of his children. So, how we can trade problems for promises. Number one, God's wrath can be avoided. Let's pick up in Exodus chapter 9. Now, you remember the plagues have already started to happen. And theologians talk about maybe those first three plagues involved the Israelites too. We don't really know for sure, but that could be true where the first three got everybody. And then from then on, they didn't. But then he's warning Pharaoh, Moses is warning Pharaoh, and he says, Therefore, at this time tomorrow, I will send the worst hailstorm that has ever fallen on Egypt from the day it was founded until now. Give an order now to bring your livestock and everything you have in the field to a place of shelter, because the hail will fall on every person, an animal that has not been brought in and is still out in the field, and they will die. Now, I love this. Listen to what's next. Those officials of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord hurried to bring their slaves and livestock inside. But those who ignored the word of the Lord left their slaves and livestock in the field. And then a few verses later, throughout Egypt, hail struck everything in the fields, both people and animals. It beat down everything growing in the fields and stripped every tree. The only place it did not hail was in the land of Goshen, where the Israelites were. So let me ask you this. How many of you have ever seen hail? Come on, this is Florida. We got it, right? The biggest hail in the world is in India, but I'm going to show you a little Texas storm from a couple of years ago just to give you a little perspective because you see it in other countries and it doesn't seem important. This is a, a little slight storm they had. This was nothing like what was brought on Egypt, uh, but, but this did some serious damage. You would not have wanted to be outside. But then let me show you a little India 1986 storm that happened. Look at the size of those chunks of rocks. That would not be fun. And by the way, just last week, they were shoveling hail off of driveways in Daytona. I don't know if you saw the pictures of that. And so this is a natural phenomenon. And what happened? God warned Pharaoh and whoever was there paying attention. And the smart ones said, you know, we've had these other plagues. Get everybody inside. And some of them said, nah, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Now, you would think by the time you had one plague or even two plagues or three plagues and now four plagues, you would think once you start to get up the number of plagues, you'd be like, you know, I think when he says there's going to be a plague, there's going to be a plague. Do you get it? And yet God warned them and they didn't pay attention. Now, I'm going to ask you a question about smoke alarms. This is one of my father-in-law's smoke alarms. He used to install alarms. This is a really good one, I'm told. I have no idea how it works or anything else. I'm sure someone will tell me after service or text me online or they're looking it up on Google right now. Now, you've got the smoke alarms in your house and all of a sudden the battery runs low and what happens? Beep. And that never happens at daytime. It happens at 3 in the morning, and if you have a pet, you may not hear it, but they do, and they will let you know that that little chirp is happening, and they will go crazy. And so what do you do? You're going to, because it's always across your house from where you are. So middle of the night, you walk across the house to figure out which fire alarm has a low battery, and you've got one in bedroom A and one in hallway B, and you stand there. And you stand there. And the battery is thinking, I'm going to wait for them to leave. You walk across the house and think, well, maybe that's not where I heard it. And as you walk across behind you, you hear, beep. 
So you go and for 15 minutes you stand there just staring. And then finally, hopefully, you figure out. And sometimes, by the way, you're right next to him and can't figure out when's beeping. Have you ever done that one? That's fun. So what do you do? You get up in the middle of the night. Typically, you do not have a 9-volt battery laying around your house. So what do you do? You pull the battery out, right? So you can get a good night's sleep. Now, only a foolish person does not replace their battery. <clears throat> That's a hint to everyone in here if you've taken your battery out of your smoke alarms, okay? And if you don't have a smoke alarm, come see me. I will pay for you to have a smoke alarm in your house. Why? Because it's such a simple thing that could save your life, and yet we don't like to be inconvenienced. It beeped at me. God has warned these people and said, for this one day, just pull everybody inside until the hailstorm's gone. And there were people who said, nah, we got work to do. Don't ignore what God is doing around you. God wants to give you grace. And yet, because of our sin, this is what happens. Listen to this. Galatians 5 says it very clearly. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery idolatry and witchcraft. Now, we love the beginning of that list because we're like, yes, I know those people. I, I know those idolaters. I, I, I know those people who are in debauchery, and then some of us are looking up debauchery, right? right? I know those people. I don't do that. And then the list comes to this point. Hatred. Well, okay, so God, what do you mean by hatred? You mean, you mean like, like hatred? You don't mean like hatred, you mean like real hate, like not the hatred I have, like the hatred discord. What do you mean? Just not getting along with people is a sin? Jealousy. You know, like your brother-in-law gets a Tesla. And you're like, are you kidding me? I'm supposed to get a Tesla. How did you? No, I don't think that, really. Actually, I just thought I want to borrow it and let it drive for me somewhere. That's how weird I am. But jealousy, have you been jealous of anybody? What they have, who they are, what they do? Fits of rage. Please don't ride in the car with me. Now, we all know somebody who has fits of rage that are out of control, and we always like to compare ourselves to them. But the Bible is not specific about that. It says when you have fits of rage, and then it goes on. Selfish ambition. Anything that you do selfishly. Did you know I could preach selfishly today? Some pastors are. The Bible actually says there's pastors that are going to get to heaven. And when they get there, he's going to go, I don't know who you are. You didn't do that in my name. And, and now there's even some revelations recently of some pastors who I thought were awesome, who had all kind of hidden sin that they had hidden throughout their life. And now it's coming to the forefront. God forgive us. Dissensions. Factions. Envy, and then we get to the rest of the list, we're like, I don't do any of those. Drunkenness, orgies, and the like. And then he said, I warn you as I did before, that those who live like this, now I'm going to come back to those words, so hang on to those, will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so if you're sitting there, you're going, well, well then how do I even get into heaven? How does this work? This word here that says, those who live like this, it's the idea of pursuing sin. So people ask me all the time, they read 1 John, and 1 John says, if you walk in the light, you have fellowship with him. But then it says, if you walk in darkness, essentially, you're not a Christian, so don't pretend you are. So what does that mean? It means, what are you pursuing? Are you just stumbling, or are you pursuing any of these things? By the way, unforgiveness would be included in this list. God's wrath is going to come because of those things. And here's the deal. Satan all the time puts ideas in our mind, and that's called temptation. Something happens, somebody slights us just a little, and we freak out. I cannot tell you the number of phone calls I've gotten over the years as a pastor where somebody called me and said, hey, my friend who's been at our church for years is not coming back. And I'm like, oh no, what happened? You didn't say hi to them today. What? That's happened more than once. I'd love to tell you that's a one-time thing. That's happened over and over and over again. So, real quick. Hi, ha, 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 
He did. All right. Right? The enemy wants to divide you. Doesn't want you to do anything. Wants you to, doesn't want you to understand God's grace. Because the truth is, the Bible says, we're all sinners. We all fail. We all for, fall short. So what do we need? Him. His grace to cover all of these things. Because if we walk and pursue these things, the wrath of God is on us. Let's continue. Number two, the blood of the Lamb still saves us. And we're going to look at what ends up being called the Passover or the Seder meal. But I want to give you a little context so you understand that you're Americans. You go to Publix, Winn-Dixie, Aldi, and you're going to buy chicken breasts, right? And they've put it in the little package. What color are your chicken breasts? Like a yellow color, right? And if you even see a speck of anything red on that chicken breast, you, you put it back. Why? They even put a little thing in the bottom so you don't see any blood. Because, you know, you wouldn't want to know that that chicken actually was alive at one time, right? Now, your grandparents did not live this way. How many of you had a parent or a grandparent that had to kill a chicken? Anybody? Yeah, right? And so that's how far we've gotten separated. We now go to the store and go, it's got a little red on the side. I don't think I can eat that, right? They, they used to grab the chicken and go, here you go. What do you want me to do with this? Pluck it, everything. So we don't get this. So I just want you to know, this is going to be very uncomfortable to you. Why? Because we're Americans. We're so separated from the importance of blood or why it matters. But God loves foreshadowing. And so what's he doing? With the Israelites, he's saying, one day I'm going to send a Savior that's going to cover you. But right now... When we get to this last plague, it's my blood, the blood of a lamb that's going to cover you. Eat nothing made with yeast. Wherever you live, you must eat unleavened bread. Then, then, bread. then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select an animal for your family and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and both sides of the door frame. None of you will go out the door of your house until morning. By the way, that's also symbolic of, of what we need to do in our houses. If you've never prayed over your house, you can do it with, with olive oil or something. You pray over your house, ask God to bless it. It's symbolic of the blood of Christ. But then also, don't allow other things in your house that go against that. Because you can pray over your house and pray over the doors of your house and then turn on the TV and invite Satan in. You can get on your internet and, and, and choose what the enemy wants. So what they say? Stay where you're at. And then it continues. None of you will go out the door of your house till morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he'll see the blood on the top and sides of the door frame and will pass over the doorway. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your house and strike you down. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land, the Lord will give you as he promised Observe this ceremony. So when they put the blood over the door, it's, a, it's symbolic of them surrendering to the Lamb. Surrendering their sins to God, which is what we do in the New Testament with Jesus. Listen to what it says in Romans 5.9. Just in case you think the Old Testament and New Testament have nothing to do with each other. Since we have now been justified by His... What's that word? Blood, I know you hate to even say it. How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Now, I don't know if you've ever prayed the blood of the lamb over somebody. That, that sounds real spiritual and, and you don't need to be hokey about it, but you need to understand it. What does that mean? You're praying for God's protection. So, so pray that over your children. Pray that over your house. You know, the Bible says you can pray peace over a house. So why couldn't you pray for God's protection over your house? You can. So God, would you protect me? Would you protect my Lord, would you protect my mind from the things the world tries to fill me with all the time? Just like we put blood over the door, we put God's word over our mind, over our, our hearts to protect us. Number three, this is such good news. God takes care of his children. 
The Egyptians urged the people to hurry and leave the country, for otherwise, they said, we will all die. So the people took their dough before the yeast was added and carried it on their shoulders in kneading troughs wrapped in clothing. The Israelites did as Moses instructed and asked the Egyptians for articles of silver, gold, and for clothing. And somebody said something to me last night I never thought of. It was enough gold to get ready for the temple in the desert, which is a pretty awesome thought. The Lord had made the Egyptians favorably disposed towards the people, and they gave them what they asked for. So they plundered the Egyptians. Now, modern uh, people who are looking at Egypt... They look at the archaeology and they say, we can't find any proof of Israelite settlements. Right. They took it all with them. They, they hit the road and took things with them. I'm sure it was plowed under and destroyed as much as it could be, although, well, I'll talk another week about that. In Luke chapter 22, Jesus takes this same supper. We call it the Lord's Supper. And the Bible clearly says that they reclined at the table. They still do that during Passover services today. And that reclining at the table means that they're free. No one's a servant. Which is really interesting because Jesus washed his disciples' feet. You know why? Because there was no servant there. Jesus became their servant and therefore there were no servants at the Lord's Supper. And he took bread and he gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, This is my body. So he's totally changed it. Given for you. By the way, the matzah would be divided into three parts at the beginning of the Passover, and they would hide one-third. You know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They would hide one-third to find later. You know, like the disciples looking for the body of Christ. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup, listen, is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. What was Jesus saying? Hey, you remember the Passover where the blood was put over the door? Well, now it's my blood put over you. Now it's my body broken for you. Jesus was going back to the Old Testament to say, I've got you. I'll take care of you. I'll never forget years ago I went to Disney. I think it was Hollywood Studios back then or something. And we got to go on a back lot tour. I don't know if you ever got to do that with a person that walks you around. I felt like a king going through. I had all our students with us. I, we took two classes with us and two teachers and I got to go. And as we're walking through, they would take us this back way into all these rides. And literally, we went. And, it was the best fast pass ever. We would literally walk in front of everybody. I could look back and go, hee, 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 as we got on all the rides, one after the other, first, first, first. And then she took us the back way into where, and I don't know if you've seen this, there's like a street that looks like the buildings are really tall, but they're not. Do you know what I'm talking about? And, and it's kind of this optical illusion as you look. And she took us back there, and she let us stand next to the building. She said, uh, you two teachers stand there, my, myself and another teacher, and I'm going to take a picture of you. And we looked like we were uh, 10 feet tall. No, 30 feet tall. We were standing next to the building. And the other teacher was really tall. So I looked like I was teeny compared to him, but I was big compared to the building. So I'm uh, uh, the ape, and he is Godzilla. But anyway, so, so we're there, and we're playing around doing this, and they're taking pictures. And all of a sudden, security from down the street doesn't see the lady, sees the two teachers inside of this zone that says you can't be here. And security starts running towards us, and screaming, get out of there, what are you doing, blah, 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 three of them, and I'm like, ah. and I just went like this, so as they're running towards us, they look over, and they see her, and she goes, it's okay, they're with me, and they said, oh, oh, okay, no problem, do you know that's what God does for you? When you get to heaven at the end of your life and you get to heaven and God says to you, why should I let you in heaven? And you go, um, I'm with him. When you surrender your life to Christ, you surrender to the blood of the lamb. That Old Testament prophecy, John 3.16 says it this way, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes, that word for belief is the word for faith. It's not just knowing about. Faith is when you trust. It's when you put your faith in this chair. You trust in Jesus. You surrender your life to him. 
Whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. See, the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are the same. The only difference is the Bible talks about in the New Testament, God is holding back his wrath to the end of time. And we as believers need to recognize the grace we've been given. And we need to help other people to find their way home to him so that one day they can say, I'm with him too. And when we all sit at what the Bible calls the supper of the lamb together and Jesus serves us lunch, we can look around the table and go, isn't it amazing? Because I know you, you didn't deserve to be here. And your friend goes, you either, but we're here because of him. If you've never given your life to Christ, you can do that today. You can avoid God's wrath. You can live life through his blood. And he loves his children. That's the big picture in everything. So today, if you've never given your life to Christ, if you're watching online or if you're here, I'd love to talk to you after the service. If you're watching online, you can send me an email or a note. At the end of the message, there's something we call the sinner's prayer, but it's not really a prayer that saves you. It's a heart condition that saves you. We use a prayer just because it's a way to say what we're thinking, but it's really a heart surrender to Christ, understanding that he died and rose again for you. Jesus, I surrender my life to you. If you want to do that today, you can. I also encourage you, if you're a Christian and you've forgotten what grace means, and you've forgotten how important it is to walk in righteousness, then today I want to encourage you, surrender again to the blood of the Lamb. All your thoughts, all your motives, all your pride. God, I need you, and you can do that today. Normally we have our time of offering here. Uh, if you're watching online, you can give online. You can give online here too, but we also have a basket on your way out. We're glad you're here today, and I love you guys. If you have any questions, you can always call me. We have a perfect song to end this service today on this time change weekend. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you for your love for us. I thank you that you sent Jesus to die for us, not because we deserved it, but even while we were yet sinners, you sent Christ to die for us. So, Father, right now, as believers, any area of our life where we have pulled things back, we surrender those to you. And, Lord, I pray if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, that today would be the day they surrender to you. Lord, help us to not be fooled if we're pursuing sin, if we're going after the ways of the world, Father, draw us back to you. I know through your Holy Spirit that if we're believers, you will convict us of sin and of righteousness. So do that today. Lord, thank you for these moments. Thank you for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great